The following program contains graphic material. Viewer discretion is advised. Surin Dakoli tempted children into his home before abusing and killing them. The horror wasn't over. He butchered their bodies, later confessing to eating their organs. He went even to the extent of uh, cooking that flesh and cutting them and uh, serving it to others and having himself. For two years, poorer parents in the rapidly changing village of Nathari in sprawling New Delhi were powerless to stop children disappearing until the remains of 19 were finally uncovered in front of their grieving families. The atmosphere was tense when they were searching near the drains area. They found hands and legs and bones. Heads were found on the other side. The perverted psychopath behind the murders was Surinda Kohli, the slumdog cannibal. Noida is one of New Delhi's fastest growing satellite towns. Business is booming in the new world of India's urban sophisticates. But in its shadows lies the semi-rural village of Nithari, where a man from a different Indian culture made his home. Impoverished migrants like Surendra Kohli service the needs of India's thriving middle class. These are the children of a lesser god, slum dogs, either by caste or circumstance, the lowest of the low. For some in authority, they and their families just don't count. A fact which locals claim led to police complacency between 2005 and 2006, when every six weeks, a child went missing. They said you keep breeding these kids, then you lose them, and then you come here to waste our time. Trees and bushes behind a yellow police barricade keep a bungalow and garden, considered luxurious when a wealthy businessman and a manservant Kohli lived there, from view. The house is in the middle of the neighborhood that the disappearance has happened. Discarded clothes still lie there as a hint of what went on. From one bridge to another bridge, that was the lane where the children would go missing. We tried telling people to seal the lane. We tried to tell the authorities, the police, everyone, to search it. Take a close look. We asked them, just look. Surinder Kohli was born in 1970 in a tiny, impoverished settlement of just 60 people in the isolated foothills of the Himalayas, a different world from that seen in India's burgeoning cities. Life for Kohli and his three brothers was hard, with monsoon rains in the summer and freezing winters. Outside their village, seemingly idyllic, lay the threat from elephants, leopards, tigers. Kohli's childhood years at the village school were not happy. He later claimed to police that village elders abused him. He was very shy, introverted child. Even what he described wasn't very good in his studies. Studied up to fifth standard or so, and after that left it. Kohli's family were Dalit, also known as the untouchables, the lowest category of Indian society. Dalit fall outside the caste system, often holding only the most menial and unpleasant jobs, laboring, grave digging. And disposing of dead animals. Some Hindus are so determinedly non-violent that killing animals is forbidden, hence they don't eat meat. The Kohlis were a vegetarian family. Despite that, at the age of 12, Kohli worked alongside his father as a butcher's assistant, so acquiring skills that he would later use to devastating effect. He used to do uh, this, uh, the use of selling of um, meat. He used to help his father, he used to uh, skin them. It was now that the impoverished, often hungry boy developed a taste for meat. It was his first step on a journey towards the horrors which lay ahead. But despite his unfortunate start in life, there was nothing in these early years to suggest what would happen later. Kohli's father described him as an innocent boy. His neighbors say he was respectful to his elders. He's a very simple, 
person of, from hills, from a poor background, doing a household job, obeying uh, the instructions, not raising voice, not asking questions. So I will find him a very, very, very simple person. With not enough work locally, Kohli, aged just 13, set off with his brother-in-law for the 480-kilometer trip to New Delhi. To the young country boy, the steaming, vibrant, crowded maelstrom of human activity must have felt like a different planet. Despite that, he made New Delhi his home. He would stay for decades, but maintained links with his village, where, at the age of 30, he would marry and start a family. In India, in a lower socioeconomic background, it's very often that uh, the spouse stays back in the village uh, because they have agricultural land or the joint family, parents and everybody is staying there. So the spouse is supposed to take care of the land and the family members. And if they have cattle, they take care of that also. And he would visit them once or twice in a year on his annual leave and be with them. Back in the big city, those who met Kohli saw nothing unusual. When I spoke to him, he was completely normal. He sounded normal, he behaved normal. There was nothing abnormal about him. The bright lights of New Delhi presented a world of opportunities for the young man from the mountains. If Surindia Kohli was overwhelmed at first, he adapted quickly. His first job was in a rundown hotel. With his experiences in handling meat, Kohli also found a job as a family cook for Delhi families made wealthy by the booming economy. He was doing well. See, from a small place, first of all, your means are very limited, your living style is very limited, your food and everything is very limited. And gradually, as this was his probably fourth or fifth job, so there is a hike in salary and the lifestyle also starts becoming a little better and then your aspirations are also affected. In 2002, Kohli became a father to a baby boy. Tragically, the boy died at 10 months old. Kohli barely saw his son. He kept the tragedy to himself, preferring not to engage with neighbors who were oblivious to the fact that the country boy felt completely out of place in the city. I would say that a lot of his frustrations uh, would also have been because his family was not living with him. So when a person is lonely and not have the social support of the family, then to get into deviant type of behavior becomes much easier because there are no strings to pull you. Separated from his family and the strict values he grew up with, Sirindia Kohli was changing. By 2005, he was working for a prestigious businessman Manindya Singh Pandya. Pandya and Kohli never went anywhere. I would see them. Kohli was always on the terrace or by the gate. And Panda, well, he spent his time in the back garden. But the swathes of migrants who'd moved to Nathari knew something was going on inside bungalow D5. Neighbours would report women, some of whom were prostitutes, coming and going between 11 o'clock in the evening and 2 in the morning. They could hear the revelry inside. As far as Muninda Singh uh, Pandey was concerned, he just admitted to the fact that he was more a party person who used to party with friends. For the conservatively brought up country boy, the drink fueled orgies in his home would have been a shock. The beautiful middle-class friends of his master seemed to be living by a different set of rules. In March 2005, a five-year-old girl playing on the streets of Nathari village after dark went missing. A few weeks later, another girl disappeared. Police did not seem too concerned, but the parents were. I could feel the pain of, uh, you know, parents who were in search of their child. They didn't know whether uh, the child has been killed or alive. In 2005, two girls living in Nathari were missing. Police told parents they had probably run away and would turn up soon. Surindia Kohli, working as a servant, 
was keeping a low profile in the same area. Cody was a nice person. He used to come here to do the laundry. There was nothing wrong with him. He was just a normal person. I have to say, we used to hardly talk. We found nothing in, uh, in his previous uh, works where he used to work in uh, other houses. Absolutely no missing, no complaint, nothing. Kohli's boss, Manandir Singh Panda, was known in the highest echelons of Indian society. The owner of the house, Manandir, well, he was a respectable guy. He was perfectly accepted by everyone. He had a good reputation. He had a good reputation with the police in particular and the ministers. He was well connected. The parents of these kids were masons, maids, rickshaw pullers. Not many of the children who went missing also went to school. Whenever kids would disappear, the parents would go to the police station. But you know, they were poor migrants. The police they didn't take the case seriously. They would tell the parents not to make children if they can't take care of them. All of them would come back disheartened after a visit to the police. A newspaper reporter was asked by the families to help, but even she held no sway. Police never acted on it for the reason, probably, that victims were from a poor family and they could not really pursue the matter. And as a journalist also, I felt the same thing. The attitude of local police was not that friendly, that victims could go and ask them to go to places and find children. They did not make much effort to find them out. So this was a major problem why this incident couldn't crack earlier. Every two weeks at this mosque, the names of the missing children were read out, but their parents' prayers for the return of their young ones went unanswered. Most of the disappearances occurred near to this water tower close to the bungalow at D5 and yards from where Kohli lived and worked for Monindir Panda. But police inaction meant neither was questioned. Meanwhile, Kohli was now a father again. His young wife had given birth to a healthy little girl. Kohli adored her, but when his wife and toddler traveled 500 kilometers to visit him, they were quickly dispatched back to the mountain village. In bungalow D5, Kohli served his master's guests. He later claimed that his roles included finding prostitutes and call girls for his master's parties. The country boy was being bombarded with sights a world away from his life in the other India, the one he came from. When you see your boss getting into these things, you also start having itch and you want to also enjoy uh, sometimes. So these were, I think, environmental factors were very important. The entire atmosphere used to make him feel that he should also get indulged in such activity, sexual activity, since his family was not staying with him in uh, Noida. His wife was in village. So probably his, what his friends told me that that was one of the reasons, the urge, the sexual urge in him probably uh, forced him to get into that kind of activity. For much of the year, Pandya left Kohli on his own at the bungalow to attend business affairs as far away as Dubai, Canada, Los Angeles and China. Kohli, the country boy, had an unimaginable freedom and luxury. He'd seen a world of illicit sexual liaisons unfold before him. His boss was not at home most of the time. And even when he was at home, there was no female uh, in the house to monitor. So he was the one who was sole in charge of the house. Away from his master and his wife, Kohli could do what he wanted. By now, his neighbor's children were disappearing at the rate of one every six weeks. Children as young as four would leave their homes and not return. Something or someone was out there. The Lal family had been farmers in Nathari for generations. As city life encroached, they made more money from taking in washing and ironing. Until now, they'd always felt safe. The Lal children are expected to help out in the family business. One morning, their 10-year-old daughter, Jyoti, was sent out to collect washing from a customer. It was around 10 o'clock when my daughter Jyoti had gone to hand in a laundry product to a customer. The customer was one of our regulars. I sent her over there. Half an hour passed. She didn't come back. 
We were waiting for her to get back for lunch together. And that's when her mother went back to the customer's house. She wanted to inquire about our missing daughter. And the customer just said, no, Jyoti went back. But she was nowhere to be found. I feared the worst. I really was frightened that she might have been abducted. Children like Jyoti are seldom accompanied on their errands. Alongside police indifference, Nathari became the perfect hunting ground for a child murderer. Hours after she was due to return, Jyoti Lal had not come back. We kept running, searching. All the boys in the area with their bikes went looking for her. And then I called my relatives and told them what had happened. To the community, Josie's fate was sounding all too familiar. Families, friends and neighbours downed tools to help. Parents would come and ask for news. Before my daughter went missing, there were two or three kids already missing. Everybody was talking about it. Everybody was trying to help each other. Throughout the evening and the night, we were searching. The whole day, that night, we were running around. We searched everywhere, but there was no news. The Lals, like many others, were feeling increasingly uncomfortable about the residents of D5. Could Sarindia Kohli cast any light on Jyoti's disappearance? Sarinda was by the gate and I asked him, have you seen a girl around? And he said, no, I haven't seen anyone around. I asked him over and over. I even asked Pandir. I went around ten times to ask Pandir. Have you seen a girl around? I said, ten times. He said no. It was 2006. Nine children had disappeared without trace over 18 months. What now had happened to Jyoti Lal? Days without a sighting of a ten-year-old girl, Jyoti Lal, turned into weeks. Like so many, she had simply disappeared. Meanwhile, servant Surinder Kohli was living it up at his master's luxury bungalow. With his boss away, Kohli could play. Kohli, at one particular point, uh, called up girlfriends of his boss and because he wanted to have them as his friends. So his, clearly, his aspirations were becoming bigger and bigger and he wanted to um, do things which his boss was doing. So uh, this is the effect of environment and culture and being in a bigger city that you start doing, uh, start aiming for higher uh, status and higher things in life. The family of little Jyoti Lal sold their possessions in a desperate attempt to find their daughter. Others were doing the same. People were asking for money to find her. They were giving me false hope. Mediums asked for money to help me find her. They said they could feel her presence. I searched for a year and seven months. We couldn't locate her. But the net was drawing in on her abductor. Late in 2006, a teenage girl called Payal went missing. Given the growing furor over the disappearances, local police made a routine visit to the bungalow where Payal had been seen. Payal's case, that happened at night. The very next morning, at 6 o'clock, I was here at the shop. By 8 o'clock, maybe 9 o'clock, the police came. It was cold and it was winter time. They took Pyle's clothes and the chattels from where she lived, just around the corner. I thought they came here to ask about my daughter, but they didn't. They were asking about Pyle. Pyle. 
It was becoming hard to ignore the gut-churning stench coming from the open drains near the bungalow, so local volunteers, angered by the slow police response, took the case into their own hands. They descended on the spot by the back of Coley's house. Their worst fears were realized as they made a grisly discovery. Residents noticed bags and they had bones, literally bags with bones in the drains. And when they brought them out, those bones were found to be of kids. There were bones floating in the water, sticking out of the bags. And after an investigation, we all came to realize they were the bones of small children. The atmosphere was really tense when they were searching near the drains area. They found hands and legs. That's what the bones were, hands and legs. Heads were found on the other side. By the end of the next day, skeletal remains of children were recovered from the drains and the following day more body parts were dug out from the drains adjacent to bungalow D5. Surindia Kohli and Manindia Panda were arrested. Apart from the torsos and the uh, bones that they found, they found some of the belongings of the children from the bungalow, which actually proved the fact that uh, children did go inside the place. And uh, what we also got gathered that Surendra Kohli was the one who used to allure children through some chocolates or some gifts and used to bring them inside the bungalow and after that they used to go missing. Investigators uncovered rubber sandals, little blouses, faded shirts, plastic trinkets, even pieces of cloth from which parents could identify their missing loved ones. The children, indications at that stage were that as many as 19 had been killed, were aged between 3 and 15. Parents rushed to the scene. The place itself was so disturbing for us. Crowd, victims crying, mother crying, taking the photograph everywhere, searching for the children, pleading everybody to find out whether my child is also there or not. Grief and disbelief quickly turned to anger. Mobs stormed the crime scene. We are poor people who come here to work and to earn, not to lose our children. If a rich kid goes missing, the child is found in two days. Payal, the young girl, she'd started working in that house. When she was found, it was pretty obvious she'd been raped before she'd been killed. Finally, after all the disappearances, the public went mad. They protested outside that house. These were poor people, not middle-class people, but they started a protest outside the house. They were very angry. The influential Manindya Panda denied any knowledge of why the bones of murdered children had been found at or near his home. Local people vandalized the bungalow, soon known in the Indian media as the House of Horror. How was it possible that the owner could know nothing about bodies buried in the walls and drains? They called for the local police to be taken off the case. The victims who were there in this case were really poor people. And uh, Muninda Pandey, being a rich person, a businessman, um, the fear was there that probably police will be bought over by the accused. And that is why there was an appeal by the local residents that the case should be given to the CBI. Would Panda continue to deny involvement? Sensing trouble ahead, the Minister for the Interior stepped in, promising that justice would prevail. Six local police officers were sacked and the case duly handed to the National Police, the CBI. The bungalow and the streets were sealed. Both Kohli and Panda were kept in custody and questioned. This senior police officer, Aaron Kumar, was given the task of interrogating both men. India wanted answers. Even detectives found the case harrowing. Or coming across with the uh, biological remains, the skeletons, the organs, the liver, uh, the uh, heart. So uh, finding of all those things, the way it was getting collected, uh, it was very disturbing. And naturally, uh, a human being, a human being, it uh, affects you after you handle the case also. It's very difficult to switch off and uh, that gives you some sort of very sick and uh, depressing feeling that uh, what is happening in the society. 
Those living in Nafari suspected an international conspiracy as they tried to understand the motivation of whoever had killed their children. They were keen to find out what could be the possible reason because yeah, human trafficking or organ trafficking were the possible reasons which were coming up. Then again, the thing was doubted because how could it be a kidney racket of, of kids? How can they take out kidney and use it? Medically, it was not possible. And then uh, child pornography, that was again taken into consideration by the police. Police was equally in a shock. For them, they were not able to understand what could be the possible reason. Detectives were certain that the killer or killers had come from bungalow D5. But was it one or both of them? Authority was given to subject Kohli and Panda to controversial new interrogation techniques. They would be injected with a specialist anesthetic or truth drug before answering police questions. They would undergo brain mapping and lie detectors, plus a panoply of psychological tests. Anything to get to the bottom of what appeared an appalling crime. It was worse than any other incident that I covered. Even to report or speak about it on air was something I was feeling like how to put it, how to put it across to the viewers. What detectives and psychologists were to uncover was a man capable of behavior beyond anyone's worst imaginings. A media scrum battles for photos as Sir India Kohli is transported 800 kilometers to India's most sophisticated psychological institute. He will answer questions about the slaughter of 15 children and four young women. With him, his boss Pandya, owner of the luxury bungalow in which the butchery took place. In early interviews, Kohli had staggered detectives when he made a partial confession. Kohli was really opening up and he was coming out with the details, giving out details to the, the officials. But Pandher on the other side was not really giving out much. He was just uh, defending himself by saying that I rarely used to stay here. I just used to come twice a month and just for uh, partying with friends and all that. There were doubts about Kohli's mental capabilities. Was he smart enough to carry out and conceal so many gruesome murders? Or was he a hapless frontman for something bigger? The CBI called all the top psychologists of the country and had a meeting. And we took their opinion that how to go about this particular case. How should we differentiate whether uh, the two persons of the crime, who is involved, who is not involved, or both of them are involved. Professor Manju Mehta specializes in clinical psychiatric medicine. She oversaw the numerous tests carried out on the two suspects. She met Kohli five times including two intense one-on-one -on -one encounters. I found that as compared to other individuals, it was difficult to establish rapport with him because of his, uh, he didn't want to maintain eye-to-eye -eye contact. He was, uh, he would talk in a very low tone and he would try to evade a lot of questions. A critical point in the examination came when Kohli was asked to draw something, a person. In completing the task, suspects reveal more than they know. One of the important thing is draw a person test. And in draw a person test, when he was asked to draw, generally people draw uh, their own identification, person of their own gender and age is also matching with their own. But surprisingly, and he drew uh, girls five to six years old. And later, uh, it collaborated with his history that uh, he was actually killing girls of five to six, seven years old only. And he was pre-obsessed uh, with that particular age and female gender. Pandya's drawings were also abnormal. The tests confirmed his obsession with young prostitutes, but they seemed to let him off the hook when it came to sex with children. His employer, in his drawing, the girl that he made, instead of making his own figure, he again, he made a figure of a girl and that was about 18, 19 years old girl. He was 55 years old and he was later we found that the girls that he was calling at home for his satisfaction, they belong to this particular age, early adult and late adolescent type, 18 to 20 years old girls were coming to his house. The test seemed to indicate Kohli as a solo killer. 
His boss may have behaved morally questionably, but his drawings betrayed no obsession with children. He just admitted to the fact that he was completely un unaware of what was happening inside the bungalow. So these facts came out and somewhere officials also felt that this could be the truth. However, as Kohli began to talk, the depths of his depravity stunned the nation. He admitted to luring children to the bungalow, strangling them with their headscarves, performing sex acts on their bodies before cutting them up and even eating some of their organs. His testimony would later be filmed before magistrates and played on TV to a disbelieving nation. Marinder Singh daily, when Madam was there, she was fine. And when Madam was not there, she took her daily call girls. And all the girls who came to the house, she made them food, she made them food. She made them food. I was alone, so 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 I but not a human. He's worse than an animal. The narration which Surendra Kohli gave actually spoke about the entire incident, the chronology that happened when he abducted one girl, when he abducted the other girl. He named each girl that he abducted and the reasoning behind it, how he did it. Everything was narrated by him. To know that he could be a psychopath or a cannibal was shocking. Cody's motivation for these grotesque acts was sexual. This was first time experience to hear about, you know, that a person could be, you know, doing things for sexual gratification in this particular way. So definitely it was very appalling and it was very difficult to hear, you know, objectively all this information because the subjective bias is bound to come when you hear about such stories. Cody's background, skinning animals, was seen in the forensic manner that he cut up the children's bodies. The forensic experts uh, of our institute, uh, they had investigated the entire case and they had also given him a body and they asked him to uh, cut that into pieces. And the way Cody had cut that, it was with precision. And in a very scientific manner, uh, he had uh, cut the body pieces. And it was amazing, you know, to see a person who has not been trained uh, or who has not been in this line where, you know, uh, autopsies or anything is done. But he could cut a human body into such, you know, a planned way. 30 CBI investigators travelled to the Kohli's mountainside village. They were looking for possible reasons for his extraordinary acts. Kohli himself claimed that he preyed on children because he was impotent. But when the team of investigators arrived at Amura, Kohli's wife was recovering from childbirth. Their son was just five days old and conceived at the peak of the murders. His wife and the police dismissed the claim that her husband was impotent. His wife told CBI officials that his behavior was never abnormal towards his children. He was just like any other person. But um, that was again a dichotomy was there. Like, how can a person be normal with his own children and do the same thing with uh, children of Natari? Family had no inkling that uh, he has some deviant behavior. Absolutely nobody, whether his uh, family members, or his employer, or a person of uh, acquaintance, nobody had any inkling that he can be a person who can even kill her. With the evidence gathering complete, India waited to hear what would happen next. Would the blame be divided between the master and his servant, or would the rarely used in India death sentence fall solely on the head of Surinder Kohli? In 2005, shocked villagers of Nathari near New Delhi were finding out about the monster in their midst. Servant Surinder Kohli confessed to the rape and the murder of 19 children and young women. After he killed them, he admitted to draining their blood in his first floor bathroom before dismembering them and eating their flesh and liver. 
chopped body parts were disposed of in the back drain or tightly packed in plastic. As the court case opened, the filmed confession of Coley conducted before magistrate several months earlier was played on national news. Coley remembers all of the murders. One of the most gruesome was the story of seven-year-old Dimple. Despite his candor, parents still did not believe that Coley had acted alone. People were not ready to take it for the reason somewhere they felt that uh, the other suspect in this case being a rich is being given and clean shit just because he's a rich guy. But as he told the story of the death of another of his victims, Coley did not implicate his boss. <laughs> Under Indian law, each of the 19 murders represented a separate case with separate charges. Eventually, Pandya was charged, together with Kohli, in connection with six out of the 19 murders. The first case to reach court concerned the rape and murder of 14-year-old Rimpa Haldar. As the men arrived in court, they were set upon by angry members of the public. When the, this news came that he ate uh, uh, the flesh of some of the victims, that also infuriated the whole society that uh, this is this cannibalism sort of thing is a, a very deviant behavior which cannot be allowed in a society. And that's why they reacted very violently. Uh, they get out of the house of Pandir, brick batted the house. Uh, uh, whenever the persons were brought to the court, they tried to uh, assault them, beat them. And it was very difficult to uh, provide them uh, security from uh, the people around the court. Seven months later, the sentence was announced. Both men were guilty. As the case was deemed the rarest of rare, the judge imposed the maximum penalty, death by hanging. As the sentence was read out, Pandya cried. Kohli showed no emotion. In 2010, the verdict on Pandya was overturned in the Indian High Court, where judges said there was a lack of evidence. He is now living in his other residence, in the city of Chandigarad. It's a decision which has not gone down well in the Thari village. Given his confession and the weight of evidence that he murdered and raped 19 children and young women and cut up and ate part of their bodies, Kohli's guilt is not in doubt. He has killed so many girls and then he went even to the extent of uh, cooking that flesh and cutting them and uh, serving it to others. 
one very thing uh, important thing that i asked that did you try to eat a human part of a child then he said yes i asked him why did you eat then he just answered that i had an urge as to his motivation psychologists believe it was predominantly sexual and initiated by the culture shock faced when Kohli, a man from an ancient version of an Indian lifestyle, encountered the different values of modern India. One of the very important factors is that probably he had a lot of sexual impulses, uh, which he was getting through the environment because seeing his boss who had a lot of extramarital relationship and uh, so that was one thing which was he found that in the environment there were a lot of sexual stimulation was there and he was not able to gratify. Today, Kohli is on death row. He seems like a model prisoner, worshipping for four hours each day. He's respectful and quiet, but although he seems impassive, Sarinda Kohli cries when he hears the names of his own children, his daughter Simran and the baby boy he has never seen. Psychologists say he has sexual perversion disorders and necrophilia and necrophagia, sexual attraction to corpses and a desire to eat their bodies. He has said he wants to kill again. When the Supreme Court has given that sentence to Kohli, which as a journalist, as a human being, both I feel is the right sentencing because he killed so many children. The main reason for all this crime is basically what Freud says sex is very important. So here it is sexual unsatisfaction which has caused these problems. Whenever I pass that house it feels ghostly. When we saw Sarindia Kohli on TV saying he was a cannibal, that he liked eating the flesh raw, we just thought he's worse than an animal. Kohli is one of hundreds of Indian prisoners waiting to be hanged. The quiet country boy and servant who killed raped and ate his neighbor's children does not want to die. It is a death sentence he is fighting. <laughs>